You're listening to the Churchosity Podcast, where we talk about the Gen X take on church culture. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Churchosity Podcast. My name is Heath Brady, and I'm your host. My name is Andrea Brady, and I'm your co-host. We're just a couple of Gen Xers who are doing the best that we possibly can to bring our perspective on church culture. And after all, this podcast is dedicated to the Gen X Christians. You know, the ones who just want to keep it simple. The ones who just want to live quiet peaceable lives. We represent the generation of Christians who sometimes looks at what others are doing and thinks, whatever. whatever. But as it says in 1 Timothy 1, five, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. So Andy, yeah, I got to tell you. You always got to tell me something. I, just, I always got to tell you something. <laughs> it's been a week. A week? It's been quite a week. Oh, it's been quite a week. Yes. Yeah. We got back from vacation and then like everything was full throttle right out of the gate. Yeah. <laughs> full speed ahead. <laughs> full speed ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Have you recovered from your vacation? <laughs> Do you need another vacation to recover from your vacation? Yeah, I think I, I think I'm good. Yeah. I think I'm pretty much recovered. I mean, I got a I got a little bit of a sore back, but that isn't because of vacation. It's just stuff, you know. Yeah, I've been super tired this week. Mm. I mean, I don't know whether it was daylight savings, and then the time change from Florida. Yeah. Yeah. And then back here, and then I'm just I've been really tired all week trying to play catch up. Well, and plus, you know, when we left. To go on our vacation, it was like 42 degrees and raining sideways. And we took a red eye. <laughs> and we took a red eye at 11 o'clock at night. Mm. And then we landed six hours later in Orlando, Florida, mm-hmm. where it's 75 degrees and 55% humidity. <laughs> and then a week later, we're back in Salem, Oregon, where it's 50 degrees and cold. And I think that. Not just the difference in time and time zones, but also the difference in climate and weather and humidity and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I do love the weather here. It was very nice today, actually. Yeah. It was a pretty Blue pleasant day. everywhere. For sure. Yeah. So what else has been going on? Tax season. Oh, yuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's enough to depress a person. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless, of course, you have simple taxes and you're getting a refund. Yeah. But. Well, I don't know about you, honey, but I've been enjoying Lent. Yes, I have also. This is the first year that I, as a human being on this great planet Earth, <laughs> have ever been able to actively participate in Lent. Yeah. And I'm excited for that. I, I have been excited for that, and especially because I, I kind of spun it a little differently than traditionally Lent is spun in a person's life. Because, Andy, typically what, what do people do for Lent? They usually give something up. Right, like drinking or movies or chocolate or you know stuff like that, right? Traditionally, Lent has always been viewed as a time when Christians give something up for 40 days. Mm-hmm. It's... It starts on Ash Wednesday, and it ends on Easter, the, the, the period of Lent. It's 40 days. Right. And so it's to, like, reflect upon or memorialize Christ's last 40 days on Earth. Mm-hmm. The end of his life on Earth before he was arrested and, and, and the whole Passion Week took place, the whole Holy Week thing. And so I approached Lent very similar to how... Lent is being celebrated in in the churches this year. And how's that? Instead of figuring out what we're going to give up, mm-hmm. we're figuring out something new that we're going to take on mm. that will help us remember 
the suffering that Christ went through. Cool. Uh, and and it, it's been kind of neat because there have been almost daily, ironically, since Ash Wednesday, there have been almost daily occurrences where I have been able to remember what I chose to put on. Hmm. And, and it's been very life-changing for me. And, and ultimately, I mean, some of our listeners out there might be thinking, well, that's just some like mechanical thing that you do in the church. And that's true. There, there, there is a mechanical aspect to it. However, um, much like pretty much all of the mechanical things that we do in our churches all Sunday long, in <laughs> everybody's church, right. it points to the glory of Jesus. It points to the gospel. Mm-hmm. And, and, what, and ultimately, Lent points at what Jesus was in the process of beginning to go through before he would ultimately go to the cross. And there was like this preparation period that he went through physically and spiritually um, to prepare for his passion. Right. And so you know, it's just been neat. Lent's been neat for me. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I've also especially enjoyed it because you've been a huge help to me in doing a children's Lent program at church. Yeah, it's been pretty fun. It's been a lot of fun. Especially the first week of Lent, because we gave away 490 jelly beans to a lucky winner who guessed the closest to how many was in the jar. Yeah. 70 times 7. Yeah. That was the lesson. The lesson was forgiveness and how many times we're supposed to forgive someone who sins against us. Yeah. So, yeah, Lent's been a pretty cool thing this year. It has exceeded my expectations. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I have to say that Lent has really helped me focus on prayer and studying the scriptures more. Mm, that's yeah. good. Yeah, it's been a daily reminder. Isn't God good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Over the last couple of weeks, I had a break from school, so that was kind of nice to not have class and be able to focus on other things that I could do that would probably be a waste of time. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I've been thinking a lot about one of our favorite television shows. Yes. You know, you and I each, I think it's pretty safe to say that I have my own set of favorite TV shows. Uh You have your own set of favorite TV shows, like of all time. And yeah. we've talked about that on a previous episode. Yeah. And together we have a collection of, of shows that we really enjoyed watching together. Correct. Right. And, and I would argue that we probably, if we were to make a list of our favorite top five TV shows of all time together. Yeah. Like for us together. Uh-huh. It'd be pretty easy to figure out which ones of those, <laughs> which ones those were. Especially because in that top five, the top three are still actively on the air. Mm. And Mm -hmm. at least three of them are still on the air. I'll I'll just say that. And two of them are not. And I think that of the top three of our favorite shows, and it depends on like what time of year it is, if we're on vacation and we have and we're watching it in syndication or if we feel like streaming it that determines like in that moment what our favorite show is yeah but i've been thinking about a lot lately the show lost okay i was going to say down to nabby but <laughs> i don't know if i would classify that as a tv show oh okay that was like a, a, well, maybe it would it be. Was. I don't know. But it was a series on Netflix, and now they've got a second movie coming out. But yeah. I was just joking because it was like the polar opposite of last. That's true. <laughs> and you like letting everybody, you like reminding all of our listeners that you got me to fall in love with Downton Abbey and The Crown during yeah. quarantine. It was quite a feat. I'm so proud of myself. You should be because those shows are awesome. <laughs> I don't know why I never watched it. I didn't know what I was missing. Now, did you get me hooked on Lost, or did I get you hooked on Lost? How did it happen? I think that I got you hooked on Lost. Okay. Just like I got you hooked on two the the other two shows mm-hmm. that I'm thinking mm-hmm. of. But 
it wasn't too hard to get you hooked on Lost. When I got you hooked on Lost, I think that season f- it was like the middle of season four or maybe season three, whenever the year of the writer's strike was that season. Okay. And you started watching it and you were absolutely lost. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, that was the problem. I tried watching the show by, you know, just randomly turning it on and watching an episode and it was very confusing and I did not, didn't like it that much. Yeah. And that's pretty much what everybody who doesn't like the show or never liked the show would say. Right. And so I I remember I worked really, really hard to convince you. <laughs> I even offered to come alongside you uh-huh. and start watching it from the beginning. Yep. Because back then, all of the shows were on DVD and I had a copy of the seasons on DVD. And so we set out on a mission and did like a massive lost marathon. And maybe it was, maybe it was the last, the final season, season six. Maybe that's when it was because you and I did a massive marathon and, (laughs) and literally got all caught up to real time. Yeah. I remember that. So that we actually had to wait (laughs) For the next episode. It was the worst. Oh, it was the absolute worst. Because it was the final season. It was the final season. I do remember that. Yeah. So, but but do you remember that feeling of like frustration that you had when you tried to watch that show because it was like what everybody was watching and and you were just completely lost? Like you couldn't get into it because you felt like you were way behind in the game. A lot of it didn't make sense. Right. And it was like all these weird, crazy things were happening, and it, I didn't, I, I didn't know the context. Right, but at the end of the day, would you say that you were happy that I convinced you, or that I was able to convince you to go back and watch it from the beginning all the way through, so that you could finish the series in real time with the rest of us? Yeah, absolutely. And and because of that, is it fair to say that Lost for the both of us? <laughs> is one of our top five favorite shows of all time as a couple. Yes, I would absolutely say so. Right. Right. So, Churchosity listeners are going, okay, what the heck does (laughs) Lost have to do with anything? Well, believe it or not, there's a conversation that Andrea and I have been wanting to have on an episode that kind of very much ties in with the point that that we're making here about how you know the the writers and producers and creators of the show Lost were so absolutely genius that if you wanted to be in the game if you wanted to be completely in an area of understanding what was going on on that show you had to stay current mm-hmm. you had you had to be invested in every episode you had to remember character backstories you know the whole nine yards there was a lot like you said andy there was a lot going on on each of those episodes because every episode especially in the first three seasons was character development and there were these flashbacks and flash sideways universe and then later there was flash forward universe and then there was like an alternate universe and it like if you did not stay tuned if you did not if you were not committed invested and and like digging in deep into that show you could get lost at any time yeah right Mm -hmm. well believe it or not ladies and gentlemen being a christian being in the game as a christian involves the same i would argue more commitment to being invested in your faith yeah and the number one way that we, I believe, the number one way that we should be investing in our faith is by spending time in the Word. Right. There there seems to, as I'm getting older, and I'm now 50, as I'm getting older, I'm seeing a lot of folks in the church as a whole that don't, that simply don't know their Bibles. Yeah. And, And I don't know if that's by choice or by circumstance, or, or what it is, mm-hmm. but um, I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for you, Andy, but you know, it's safe to say that we know a lot of examples of biblical illiteracy 
yeah. that are demonstrated on somewhat a regular basis. Yeah. Well, I mean, studying the Bible and knowing the Bible and knowing it well is a foundation of our faith. It lays the groundwork and it, you know, it teaches us who God is and how God saves. It's really super important. And um, I don't think people are investing any time, as much time as they probably should in studying the scripture. Right. You know, on, on social media, <laughs> something that's kind of fun. I've been seeing lately memes that say things like, Name something people think is in the Bible but really isn't. Oh, wow. Have you seen those? I have, and I've seen some where in the comment section, some of the things have been kind of lewd and crass, you know, kind of like that old JesusIs.org thing oh. where people would just say some horrible, mean, nasty things about Jesus. But yeah. um, I'm sure that that's not what you're referring to. No, I'm referring to... Fun things. That oh, good. The glass half full comments. Yes. <laughs> like, for example, that there was an apple in the Garden of Eden. Oh. Which, you know, the Bible says there was fruit, but it never said it was an apple. Right. Or that a whale swallowed Jonah. And the Bible doesn't say it was a whale. It said it was a great fish. But it could have been a whale. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but it doesn't specifically say whale. It just says giant fish. Right. Right. Or something like the three wise men. It never said there were three wise men. We just know that there's more than one. Yeah. Do you know where the whole idea of three wise men comes from, though? Where? The three gifts. Oh, uh-huh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Mm -hmm. So it's just assumed that there were three magi because mm -hmm. there was three gifts. Mm -hmm. There's actually an old uh, traditional old wives tale uh, that there was a fourth magi that didn't make it because he got lost. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Fun little anecdote to study on the side. Google it. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. They actually wrote a children's musical about it. It's called The Great Late Potentate. Oh. And it's kind of cute. That's cool. Anyhow. Anyhow, I just thought that was interesting because even, you know, for myself, I've read through the Bible and I think I know the Bible pretty well. <laughs> I would say I can always study. I'm always studying, so I'm always learning. I haven't arrived. But some of these phrases and things that people come up with that's, that um, people think are in the Bible, a few even got, got to me. Mm. Yeah. I love and respect so much how you, Andy, personally prioritize being in the Word for yourself. Mm. You know, as, as a husband, mm -hmm. it, is, it is invigorating to be married to a woman who is passionate about knowing her Bible. Yeah. Well, thank and not you. even as a husband, as, a, as your brother in Christ. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I, think... I, don't, I don't want to sound like, you know, patriarchal there. <laughs> well, I think it's fun, you know, you and me... I'm blessed with, you, you know, a husband. You. <laughs> You're blessed with a husband? A bl I'm blessed with a husband who likes to talk about the Bible with me. Oh, we have some wonderful... We Over the years, you and I have had some pretty heavy, meaty theological conversations. Yeah, I mean, if I were all by myself, and it'd be hard because I'd like to... I mean, I think it's important to have somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, come alongside you and... You know, you can talk about the scriptures, bounce ideas and thoughts, and, you know, encourage each other. And that's discipleship. Right. We bring that up a lot on our show. Mm -hmm. And how discipleship is the means of growing in faith. But those means of discipleship are practical applications of what you're learning or finding in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So you got to be in the scriptures first. And then come alongside somebody or have somebody come alongside you mm -hmm. and talk about it. Right. You know, it's pretty awesome. I love, I love, love, love the Bible so much. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a handful of things in the Bible that are grossly misquoted, misused, or butchered all of the time. Yeah. And... <laughs> Like what? It's so frustrating. <clears throat> like, have, have have you ever seen those medallion things or, or like little coin-shaped things that 
people wear as necklaces that have like a zigzag cut down the middle. So like they cut it in half. Yeah, yeah. And like one, like, like typically you'll have a friend that moves away. Mm Mm-hmm. Or a friend that goes on a mission trip, or a friend that you know goes off to be a missionary or whatever, and and you'll see this whole like ritualistic pomp and circumstance, emotional uh, send off. Right. And, and you wear one half the necklace, and they wear the other half. Correct. And what's the verse that's on there? Well, the verse that's on there. Well, first of all, on on the necklace, if you put the two pieces together. In quotes, it says, "May the Lord watch over you and me while we are apart." Ah, and at first glance, that's a really, really sweet platitude. Mm-hmm. Like, like, of course, you would want that to be your prayer. <laughs> that 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 your brother, your sister, your friend, you know, whatever it might be, that while you are apart, that the Lord watches over the both of you. Certainly, that would be your prayer. That would be your heart's desire, right? Right, of course. But here is a terrible example of a verse being misappropriated, mm. taken out of context, and spun for a different type of agenda altogether. Mm-hmm. Because that verse is a direct quote of Genesis chapter 31, verse 49, mm-hmm. which says, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Sounds great, right? Yeah. However, in context... This is a conversation that Jacob, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, the conniver, the supplanter, the usurper, (laughs) the one who stole his brother Esau's birthright. Right. Jacob has spent the last 14 years working for his uncle Laban. In order to purchase the rights to marry not one, but two women and two concubines or handmaids or whatever you want to call them. So he's now got four women that he's had children with. And he, in the middle of the night, sneaks off with all of these women and all of these children and everything that belongs to Laban. They basically, between the five of them, Mm -hmm. they stole all of Laban's stuff. In the middle of the night, all of his flocks, all of his possessions. Mm -hmm. And Laban catches up with Jacob. Mm -hmm. Now, over the course of of several years, Laban and Jacob have grown rather distasteful towards one another. (laughs) You could say that. Which is part of the reason why Jacob sneaks off in the middle of the night with his two wives and two concubines. And you can look this up and read the backstory. It starts way back, I think, in Genesis chapter 29. But... Jake Laban catches up with Jacob, Mm -hmm. like probably wants to kill him. Yeah, I would imagine. And so they get together and, you know, they meet up and Jacob pretty much talks him down. And so they end up making a blood oath Mm -hmm. that, you know, Laban and Jacob basically say to each other, you go that way (laughs) and I'll go this way. And right here, we're going to build a stone altar monument type thing to commemorate this agreement. And we're going to make a blood oath pact on top of this monument. And, and so that this, this, this stack of rocks is basically the border. Mm. You don't cross over to my side and I won't ever cross over to your side. And may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Basically what Laban is saying, because Laban isn't a believer in in Adonai. He's not a believer in the God of Jacob. And he's telling Jacob, your God will hold you accountable to the agreement that you have made. Wow. That is the depths of Jacob's (laughs) sneaky behavior. Yeah. That an ungodly man is saying that Jacob's God is going to keep a watch on him. And hold him accountable. In other words, there's nothing joyful about this verse. No. And yet this verse is used as a means of a joyful expression Mm -hmm. and printed on jewelry. (laughs) Yeah. So, like, that's an example, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's another example that absolutely drives me nuts when I hear it. Does it drive you nuts? (laughs) Oh, yes. Drives me nuts. Okay, what is it? When people say... The Lord will never give you more than you can handle. Oh, yes. yes. You ever heard anybody say that? 
Yeah, I've heard that a lot, actually. Because, you know, life is so stressful. Mm. And, you know, bad things happen and, you know, it piles up, you know. And we've experienced that, Mm -hmm. you know, both personally and professionally. I mean, certainly all things 2020, a lot of people were probably saying that to each other. You know, well, the Lord's not going to give you more than you can handle. The problem is, and th- and that is a th- again, that is a beautiful platitude, right? That I- that is a great thing to say to somebody to encourage them, you know. And and, and I'm not going to speak for God. I'm not going to pretend to know the mind of God. But it would seem logical to me that as a brother or sister in Christ, as a child of God who is saved by grace, that the Lord would not allow more to happen to you than is necessary but then again how much can a person take like really yeah you know Hmm. i mean i can think of instances in my life where i would have to argue with that person saying that the lord would never give me more than i could handle Hmm. the problem is is that it's a horrible misquote a misinterpretation Mm -hmm. of a verse in first corinthians chapter 10 Verse 13. Oh, okay. The phrase is contained within this verse. God is faithful, mm-hmm. will, not allow, will not allow beyond what you are able to handle. That phrase is in there. But let's, let's unpack the whole entire verse. Context. <laughs> context, right? The context of this verse Mm-hmm. The context of what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is dealing with their areas of temptation. Oh, temptation. Yeah. Things like eating too much, drinking too much, grumbling and arguing with one another, acts of immorality. Mm-hmm. All of these different areas that the, that the Corinthian church were being tempted in. Mm-hmm. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13... No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, there is no temptation on this earth that you are being tempted with that everybody else or anybody else hasn't also been tempted with. Mm. Everybody has gone through, everybody's tempted by this kind of stuff. You're not that special. Right. (laughs) It's what it's saying. And then he says, but God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able Mm -hmm. but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it interesting yeah that's what the verse actually says god is faithful and he you know jesus knows what we're being tempted with Mm -hmm. the very season of lent is a representation of what Jesus went through for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and then being tempted by the devil himself Mm. after fasting and praying for 40 days in the wilderness. So Jesus knows what what we are tempted by. And because we are signed and sealed by God when we are saved, those temptations still exist for us. Yeah. The temptation to go back and be the ungodly, immoral person before we were saved, those are always going to be there. And this is Paul's promise to the church that there is no temptation that you're going to face that God is going to allow that will, o- that will overwhelm you. God will go so far as to provide you with the way out mm-hmm. so that you won't fall. Being tempted is not a sin. How you choose to react to that temptation can be a sin. True. Yeah. And so God is faithful and will provide you with the way out so that you won't fall in your temptation. That's what that verse is actually saying. Mm-hmm. Not God won't give you more than you can handle. Right. Because I don't, I don't think I have ever heard a single person say that phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. And have that directly relate to something they're being tempted by. No, usually it's about something that, something bad that's happened. Something's that going have. on in their life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got one. Oh, awesome. Money is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. Right. Are you sure that that's not in the Bible? Well, it says that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It Actually, doesn't... it doesn't even say that. 
the love of money. There you go. Is the root of all sorts of evil. Right. All sorts of evil. Yeah. Yeah. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, what about that? What about that f- verse? Is frustrating. Well, it makes it sound like uh, money itself is the root of all evil. Um, I mean, that's not true. There's lots of evil in the world that doesn't find its root in money. Correct. Um, and having money or in things like that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an evil thing to have. Correct, because scripture also says that God has created man with the ability to create wealth for himself. Yeah. So it, it's a very um, dicey thing. <laughs> yeah. And who do you typically hear say that phrase? Money's the root of all evil? Yes. I don't know. A lot of preachers. Oh, a lot of preachers and a lot of people who think that, you know, there there are certain, I'll say branches for lack of a better term. There are certain branches, there are certain communities mm-hmm. within the church that subscribe to living by humble means. Right. And, you know, I, I can't point to a verse, chapter and verse in scripture that says that that's okay or that that's not okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that's good for them. I'm not trying to like relative truth the conversation, but... Good for you. <laughs> right. But there are people in, in the church, at the capital C, in the church, that think that wealth is a bad thing. Yeah. And and so, you know, you have preachers, you have Christians, you, ha- you have people, you even have people that are unsaved that know this verse, or at least a version of this verse. And they say that money is the root of all evil. Mm. And, you know, much like the verse in Genesis that I... That I came up with this verse is a is a very great example of how a verse is misquoted misappropriated Mm -hmm. and not understood correctly you know that verse actually says that the love of wealth and you could even go into the greek yeah the love or pursuit or obsession with generating wealth is the root of many different kinds of evil Mm. But not all. Nowhere in the Greek will you find the word all. Just as many. Yeah. Because the the obsession with generating wealth is a form of what? Idolatry. Idolatry. Right. Money, you know, if, if becoming wealthy, if becoming rich, if becoming, you know, having all of these possessions, of, you know, worldliness, you know, at an all-time high is your passion and God is number two or lower that's idolatry mm. yeah that's a great example <laughs> thank you do you have any more i do god works in mysterious ways doesn't god work in mysterious ways he does but it's not necessarily in the bible mm. like in isaiah 55 verses 5 through 9 mm. it talks about how god's thoughts are not your thoughts and his ways are not. The Bible verse says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares mm. the Lord. So he, um, if you read like verse 5 through 9, it talks a lot about how God is different than us. Mm-hmm. And, um, but that doesn't... There's nowhere in the Bible that says God works in mysterious ways. I think there's a U2 song about mysterious ways. <laughs> oh, wait. She moves in mysterious ways. Yeah. <laughs> totally different thing. My bad. Right. <laughs> yeah, isn't that... That's really that's really great that that, uh, that you're pointing that one out. Mm-hmm. Um, because God is so much different than us. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think you bring up a really great point just as a side, Andy. What? That a lot of times as Christians, we, we forget that the way that God behaves, the way that God moves, the way that God feels, the way that God thinks, the action that he takes is like we would, we would do it. Mm. And we're, we're fallible. We are imperfect creatures. Right. You know, in context with our conversation here, this, this fits perfectly because 
part of reading your Bible is theology. It's getting to know who God is mm -hmm. through reading and studying the scriptures. And a lot of times we can be stymied by seeing the actions or the thoughts of the Lord and somewhat shocked at times, especially in the Old Testament, yeah, at God's behavior because he doesn't do anything really like we would think to do. Mm -hmm. When we think of justice, we don't think of justice like God thinks of justice. When we think of wrath, we don't think of wrath like God thinks of wrath. When we think of love, <laughs> we certainly don't think of love like God thinks of love. That's true. And this is why it's so important to, to up your biblical literacy game. Right. Because the more time you spend in the word, the more you know and understand God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, as a youth pastor, I bring this up so many times that like, like if you bought a new car, the first thing you're going to do is grab that, or you should, is grab the <laughs> manual out of the glove box. You know, recently you and I went on a little road trip and it was, it was, you know, like a four hour drive mm. and there were long stretches of freeway that I really didn't want to have my foot pressing on the gas pedal because I got a bad knee. Right. The problem is that I don't know how to put the car in cruise control. Right. Because, duh, I didn't look at the manual. Yeah. I just assumed that it's going to look and behave like all other cars do. Yeah. But lo and behold, guess what? It doesn't. Yeah. So we're in the midst of driving. And remember what I said to you. Could you pull the manual out of the glove box and look up cruise control exactly. and tell me how to make the stinking thing work? Yeah. Well, not only that, after we got our car, I didn't know how to put gas in it. Right. <laughs> I know that sounds so boneheaded, but no, it doesn't. It's not boneheaded at all. There was no button or release latch for the um, gas door where the gas cap is, you know? And I just I was like, beyond words i could not figure it out i had to look in the manual i felt so stupid but you see my point yeah like had we like read the manual mm -hmm. we would have known those basic things like how do you open where the gas cap is <laughs> and how do you put the car in cruise control right like we need to read our bibles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i have one last example Ooh. okay this might cut a little deep with some of our with some of our listeners. Okay. But I have I have to bring this up. What is it? There is a lot of confusion in in all of Christendom, like across the spectrum of Christendom. Doesn't matter what denomination you are from, or non denomination you are from, where you were raised, what part of the country you live in, where your church is. Doesn't matter. There is a conversation of conf that is confusing as to how a person is saved. Oh. What is the proof that a person is saved? Like, I've actually conducted an experiment. I've actually asked groups of people, what do you believe is the means for salvation? And, and the answers are not as common as you would think. Huh. And the answers are not, you know, few. And, the, the, it's staggering, the number of different answers that I get. And a lot of times... It's staggering because these are individuals who have grown up in church and been Christians the majority of their lives. Wow. Okay. And so it isn't that I it isn't that this example is one of a verse that is horribly misquoted or misappropriated or butchered altogether. It's a verse that I believe is forgotten. Okay. How is a person saved? Romans chapter ten, verse nine. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved hmm. and then Paul again he goes on to write that with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness yes. and with the mouth they confess resulting in salvation wow. you want to know how a person is saved just, you know, period, point blank. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. 
Right. Now, I'm not going to get into soteriology here and walk everybody through like the actual process of what takes place within a human being when a person becomes saved. Mm -hmm. But this verse is plain and simple. And that's one of the things that I love most about the gospel is that it's simple. You want to spend eternity with God? You want to live forever in heaven? You want to spend your the rest of your natural born life getting closer to God? This is what it looks like. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead. Raised him from the dead. And what was that scripture re- reference again? Romans chapter 10 verse 9. All right. So I could go on and on and on and on and on, but for the sake of our listeners' time, I think that you and I have done a pretty decent job of explaining why it is so important to up your biblical literacy game. Yeah. Because if if a person is biblically illiterate, then they're missing out on opportunities to know biblical truth. So where would someone who wants to study the Bible, where do you suggest they start? That is an awesome question. I'm glad that you asked me that because I actually get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. If a person, especially if a person is a brand new believer in Jesus, they're like they're brand new saved, let's say. Mm -hmm. I typically suggest that that individual read the book of John. And the reason why, there's two reasons why I suggest that people start in the book of John. Number one, John was Jesus's best friend. (laughs) <laughs> Who is going to know Jesus as a human more than his best friend? Right. So everything that John writes in his epistle, everything that he writes in his gospel, is from the vantage point of, I'm writing about what my best friend said and did. Mm-hmm. Second reason why I suggest the book of John is because John is full of theology. Yeah. Of the four gospels, John is rich with theology. Mm-hmm. I mean John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was and the word was God and the word was with God. Boom, right out the gate. Theology. Right. So, that's where I typically tell people who have never read the Bible before to start. Yeah. Because there's the tendency to, oh, I just got saved. I have a Bible. I'm going to start at the beginning and read Genesis. <laughs> And I'm not knocking that. No. But... Some people, that floats your boat. Awesome. I love the book of Genesis. It's an awesome book. There's lots of great and rich things to learn from the you book might, of Genesis. You might get to the book of Numbers and then get tired. Get tired. <laughs> but Numbers is a fascinating book. Right. It really, really is. Right. There's There's some deep stuff hidden in there. Yeah. So... To answer your question, Andy, if, if it's especially if it's a brand new Christian, yeah. or or if it's someone who's been a Christian for any amount of time, but they've never really cracked their Bible open, yeah, start in the Book of John. I mean, even if you've read the Book of John a hundred times, it never gets old. I mean, it is the book of the Bible that contains chapter three, verse sixteen. <laughs> That's true. The other suggestion that I have is to read the Book of James. Mm. And the reason why I like the book of James is because there's a lot of practical application in the book of James Mm -hmm. about how to tame your tongue, about how to love one another, about how to keep yourself rooted and grounded in the truth so that you're not carried away by every wind of doctrine that's out there. Wow. So James is rich Mm -hmm. with with practical application. So I, I suggest personally that people read the book of John and read the book of James. That's a, that's a phenomenal launching point for, awesome. for personal Bible study. Mm-hmm. That's just my suggestion. Yeah. I'm really glad you asked that. Oh, thanks. Well, I also think it's important that someone find someone to talk to, like a disciple <laughs> A disciple I know that sounds dorky. Um, no, it doesn't. Find I just, it's someone just really cute. that you can talk to and talk to you about your study of the scripture now i'm embarrassed why <laughs> i don't know because I, I said it weird <laughs> it was cute though thank you but yeah. you're you 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 hit the nail right on the head the scripture yeah. says that as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know even at the age of 50 i find it so beneficial and crucial to my life to have someone in my life that i'm actively engaging with about 
biblical truth, about biblical savvy, about theology and doctrine and all of those things, yeah. who has been a Christian longer than I have. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily older than me. Yeah. But somebody who, even somebody who knows the Bible, in my opinion, better than I do. And that's why you talk to me, right? Exactly. <laughs> You're my disciple no, but all jokes aside, that is what <laughs> discipleship is. Right. You know, you that word discipleship gets thrown around like confetti in the church. And mm-hmm. the bottom line is, if you want to know what discipleship is, first of all, it's not a program. It's not really a process. It's actual obedience to the Great Commission. Jesus said, go into all of the world and make disciples. So how do you make disciples? Well, look at Jesus's example. When he called the 12 OG disciples. <laughs> Those OGs. <laughs> yeah. He, he didn't put a clipboard out on the information center and say, anybody who wants to sign up for discipleship class, there's your chance. He, he didn't say, anybody who wants to be my disciple, here's a book that we can go through together. Right. No, he went to 12 guys and he said, you... Drop what you're doing, follow me, I'm going to make you my disciple. Mm. He was intentional. Yeah. Right? So discipleship is an intentional relationship. Mm-hmm. It's, it's extremely important in, in the life of a believer. You can't be a lone wolf Christian. It's, it's not smart and it's not wise and it's not beneficial. You've got to have somebody all the time who is more mature in the faith than you to guide you through the scriptures and to develop a discipleship relationship. Those 12 guys, they were close to Jesus, especially three of them, and especially one of them, which was John. Right. Because they spent time with the Lord. Mm-hmm. We don't have the benefit right now of spending time physically in the presence with our Lord. Mm-hmm. But we can spend time in the presence with our Lord through getting to know him in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And we can do that with each other. True. So, great point. I do have some good news. Oh, there's. I didn't know we had bad news. <laughs> well, the way we uh, entered into this conversation, we are saying how we think um, people could be reading their Bibles a little bit better. Yeah. But statistics have shown that in 2021, people more people were reading the Bible. Now, maybe it was because of COVID. I don't know. Christians got locked up and had nothing else better to do. Yes. It went up a little bit. So that's a good thing. What does that mean? It went up a little bit. (laughs) Because the number should be 100%. Right. (laughs) The American Bible Society finds that 181 million Americans opened a Bible in the past year, which was up... 7.1% 7.1% from the previous year. Oh, a whole 7%? Yeah. Wow. And um, 24% of Americans say their Bible reading has increased this year compared to last year. That's cool. Yeah. A quarter a quarter of America has been reading their Bible more? <laughs> I guess so. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Not, I mean... Not to, I really don't want to rain on that at all, but it's un- if you're right, and some of that has to do with COVID... Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that uh, something like a pandemic would drive folks to read their Bible more. Well, I guess whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. (laughs) I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the thing, one of the last things that Moses said to the nation of Israel before they were about to enter the promised land. Yeah. Because Moses sinned and forfeited his opportunity to go into the promised land with the nation of Israel. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. So in the book of Deuteronomy, he's basically giving a very, very long farewell address to his people. Mm. And one of the things that he says that is so staggering to me, even to this very day, is do not forget the Lord when times are good. Right. And it is uncanny to me, and I'm guilty of this too. It is uncanny to me how often we as Christians don't consider the Lord Mm -hmm. when everything is just smooth but when the unicorns and rainbows disappear and it and the clouds get dark and the rain starts to fall just like the people who were stuck outside of the ark yeah we start to look up that's true and I got one final point and then and, 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 and then I'll close this out one of my former pastors used to say 
that it is extremely smart on the part of a Christian to have a go-to verse oh. for their biggest area of temptation. Interesting. Okay. And that is something that I fail to employ on a regular basis. <laughs> and the evidence of that is is true in my life. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and having this conversation, you and I, with our listeners, Andy, yeah, really has reminded me that I need to go back. Like, I've been a Christian a very, very long time. I've been in the ministry a very, very long time. Even so, and I would argue even more, I need to be reminded, go back to the basics. Yeah. Get in the Word. Spend time with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because all of these other things are distractions. It's true. And that brings us to this week's proof that we're living in the last days. All right, so I got something. Oh, you've got something. I've got something. All right. And this, and this may not appeal to all of our listeners, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this, this may not appeal to you. But to me personally... I feel like we're living in the last days because of this. What is it? So in real time, at at the moment that we're recording this, I just received news that Bobby Wagner has accepted the details of a contract offer to go and play for the Los Angeles Rams. Now, Bobby Wagner is a Hall of Fame linebacker who has played for my Seattle Seahawks oh. his entire career. Right. I was racking my brain, Bobby Wagner, Bobby Wagner. <laughs> like you're like, where do I know that name from? Like I said, this isn't going to appeal to all of our listeners. But, you know, I've been a Seahawk guy my entire life. Mm-hmm. Like true to the true like to the core, my Seahawks, right? And Bobby Wagner was the last remaining Legion of Boom member. Right, from when we won the Super Bowl. That whole era where the Seahawks were just like unstoppable practically. Mm-hmm. And our defense was, you know, just on point. And we had the Legion of Boom. It was all those guys are gone now. Yeah. And I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna talk about the Russell Wilson thing. That that's depressing to me. But Bobby Wagner is gone. Hmm. And it's like for the first time in a very, very, very long time, and I'm talking like 20 years, for the first time in a really, really long time, I'm going to have a difficulty rooting for my Seahawks because I think we're going to be <laughs> terrible for a while. Well, you're not a Fairweather fan, are I'm, you? No, no, no. Don't hear me say I'm a Fairweather <laughs> fan. I'm just saying that it's it's <laughs> that it's going to be hard to watch. Right. They're my boys, mm-hmm. right? Pete Carroll is still the coach. Pete Carroll is my dude. You know, that might infuriate a lot of our sports listeners out there. I don't care what you think. Pete Carroll is my dude. Mm-hmm. He's, he's one of the greatest coaches to ever be in the NFL. What the Seahawks have done in the last 20 years has been so much fun to watch, especially in the last 10 years. And now, like, it was one thing to see Russell Wilson be gone. But now Bobby Wagner, too. Those two dudes were drafted to the Seahawks in the same year. Wow. And, like, he's gone. Yeah. Like, Bobby Wagner... So it's the end of an era. It's the, it's the official end of an era. And it's sad for me. Especially because, like... The NBA st- stole my Sonics. The Mariners have been hot garbage for 20 years. Yikes. And now the Seahawks, my Seahawks. I don't know what's going to happen with them, but it doesn't look promising. I got no I got no joy in the in the hometown sports arena now. <laughs> right. And, you well, know, we do live closer to Portland now, so maybe I will we can never explore. be a Trailblazers fan. Oh, That's I... never going to happen. <laughs> that is never going to happen. Hey, but you like basketball. I do like basketball, but I could go watch one of my kids play in their high school basketball game. Oh, okay. And, and I'm straight. <laughs> you know, I'm good. Right. No. That, uh, even, even though the C- even though the Seattle SuperSonics don't cur- currently exist, I will not join another fan base just because I moved. Because that's like cheating on my Sonics. I see. <laughs> 
But I'm a sports guy, and and having these struggles now, Bobby Wagner is gone. I definitely feel like all of that is definitely proof that we are in fact living in the last days. And that is all we have to say about that. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Churchosity Podcast, the show where we try to give you the Gen X take on church culture. And thank you once again, as always, to my amazing co-host and wonderful wife. Aw, thank you. Be sure to follow us on all the socials. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our handle is at Churchosity Pod. Drop us a message and give us your feedback because we'd really love to hear from you. And if you're listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please be sure to give us a rating. And if you feel like it, also leave us a review. A rating and a review not only helps boost the popularity of Churchosity, but it also helps to spread the word to others and make it easier for them to find Churchosity Podcast. And another way that you can support Churchosity Podcast is to spread the word by telling a friend to tell a friend what we're doing here. Yeah, let them be part of the conversation too. But always remember that the goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart. And from a good conscience. And a sincere faith. So we thank all of you once again for listening, and we'll catch all of you next time on the Churchosity Podcast. Peace.